Welcome to Philadelphia. You are uh, in rather remarkable surroundings that I, I recognize with some mixed emotions, truth be told. <laughs> well, thank you for the welcome. Uh, is it General or Mr. President? Well, it is right General, now. sir, uh, and I am a Virginian, and I don't take oh, hands, but I bow in oh, your honor. Yes. Uh, I'm an old school Virginian. Uh, I will confess to you that Colonel Hamilton pressed me rather strongly, and during my presidency, he has urged me to take hands, and I do so two days a year, on Independence Day and on my birth night celebration. But aside from that, I, I bow in your honor. I you may also call me whatever you want. It is a free country. But given <laughs> the choice, I prefer general. As I expected. I think you were more comfortable being general. Well, you know, uh, the presidency, I revere the establishment of the executive branch. But truth be told, it is uh, rather experimental in nature. And there have always been generals. So I, I, I am more comfortable with general. A good point. Uh, well, presidents are well established now where the presidency is. How um, many have there been? There are, uh, have been 45. 40 and 5? Of whom uh, a few were generals besides yourself. Well, I'm heartened to hear that. It is important to understand what it means to send people into harm's way. Those who were not generals, I'd say the largest group were governors ah. coming from their state or respective states. Ah. And uh, we've been well served by gods and generals. Uh, uh, other gods, Virginians? By, 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 uh, by governors and generals. Other Virginians, yes, indeed. Yes, sir. Uh, you were the first of what turned out to be five Virginians uh -huh. in the first seven presidents. Really? Yes, Virginia's had a great influence. Uh, one of my uh, secretaries told me that you are also a Virginian. Yes, not by birth, but by long standing now. And apparently you are, you are living in lands that I, as a 14, 15 year old, I helped um, survey. There were lands that were owned by Lord Sir Thomas Fairfax out in the western portion of Virginia. Indeed, it's uh, the town of Washington, Virginia. Ah, well, I, uh, I appreciate the approbation, but uh, it is a little bit too monarchical for my flavor. <laughs> well, indeed, it's 230 odd years later and the attorney general of our state is a Fairfax. Ah, remarkable. <laughs> I'm happy I'm to see sure. they have come back. I'm not sure of <laughs> a direct descendant, but uh, ah. shares the name. Uh, so, General, you spent a great deal of time here. I spent a third of a year here, four months. And um, we don't have actual notes of the proceedings, some not direct quotations for, for the most part. We do have some uh, of Madison's notes. I will tell you, Mr. Madison, took copious notes. And they've been published and are accessible. They were not published for a long time, uh, I think 50 years. But um, tell me, did you speak often? Well, in reality, when I was unanimously elected to be the president, the presiding officer of this constitutional convention, I took my position on the dais, you may see that it is literally raised slightly. Yes, it is. And as such, when one takes that position, one also assumes the role of uh, mm. an honest broker in the process, concerned with the process, certainly the content, but also the process. And so I did not speak very often because I felt it would be inappropriate to uh, sway an argument one way or another. Um, I will tell you then when matters pertinent to Virginia itself came up, I stepped off the dais and I joined the Virginia delegation. Uh, there was another gentleman that took over as the presiding officer for that short period of time. Mm -hmm. But then I resumed my, my, my role. I of course spoke in the beginning and I welcomed everyone. I told them that secrecy was absolutely critical and why was it critical? It was critical so that the newspaper men would not have early advice with regard to what we were speaking about and publish this discussion because the discussion was a discussion in motion. Things could change during the process, but once it is printed in their newspapers, the public might be subjected to uh, premature speculation and concern. And so everything had to be secret. Um, 
and then I pretty much sat back without speaking. I will own to the fact that there was one moment in which one of the delegates, uh, Mr. Jerry from Massachusetts mm -hmm. Bay, mm -hmm. uh, he suggested that there be a resolution in the Constitution that the United States Army, many people always fearful of a standing army, should never be more than 5,000 soldiers, if I recall correctly. Uh, I was heard saying, do you know sotto voce? Yes, indeed. It is a loud whisper. Yes. I was heard saying that that will be fine as long as any enemy of this country promises never to attack with more than 3,000 soldiers. <laughs> uh, I spoke one more time to chastise people for the secrecy issue, and uh, then I spoke at the end to thank everyone and to release them uh, from the process. Well, first on the matter of the soldiers, how many soldiers were under your command during the Revolutionary War? It changed all throughout the war. There were times where I had um, as many as 25,000 of people enlisted, and that was shortly after France came into a treaty of alliance with us and a secret military treaty with us. But there were also times when we were down to numbers nigh on 3,000. Uh, more typically, for example, when we marched into the Valley of the Forge mm -hmm. in mid-December of 1777, I marched 12,000 soldiers into that valley, uh, and almost half of them were unfit for duty or their enlistments were about to expire. And then you had a very severe winter, as I understand. We had a very difficult winter at the Valley of the Forge, but it was not the weather that was the enemy. We had far worse winters, Morristown, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the weather was not the enemy. Deprivation was not the enemy. That, that followed us every, everywhere throughout the war. The British, warm and comfortable here in Philadelphia City, they were not the enemy. Disease was not the enemy. The enemy, that winter of 1777 and 78, mm -hmm. was the Congress, because the Congress was putting everything into committee. They had countless committees when we marched in. They had doubled the number of countless committees when we marched out six months later. They could not make a decision. It was not completely their fault. They were responsible for everything, but they had the power to do nothing because we were still being governed under the Articles of Confederation, which was a almost useless document. So they could not raise a tax to support you? They could not raise a tax to support us. They could not uh, negotiate treaties. They, there were many, many limitations, and they were substantial. Uh, so, you know, uh, there was talk by myself and some of our officers at that time, and I'm sure this will bear no resemblance in your day and time, but we sometimes referred to them as a do-nothing Congress. <laughs> a phrase that resonates right through to the present. It does. It does indeed, uh, with the uh, metaphor of gridlock. I am very, very sorry to hear that. Uh, well, it, it has its advantages, but um, uh, it's not, a, not viable in the long run. Quite right. When you were presiding, did people then have to seek your recognition to speak? Well, there was a, a protocol, but by and large it would be, have, have become far too unwieldy for me to recognize every individual. When things would grow to a heated discussion, uh, then I would, of course, set in to control the process. Um, I will tell you that I was amused to learn from uh, Colonel Hamilton that he felt that though I spoke very rarely, <clears throat> he said that every man jack in this room kept an eye on my jawline, and depending on whether my jawline was stiff or relaxed, they knew how I felt about a given subject. <laughs> and if truth be told, I did speak with regularity after hours at the various mm -hmm. taverns and over dinners and suppers and such. And I did convey my feelings on many things. Let me ask you about Hamilton. He had served you in the Revolutionary War, personally served you. Yes. And was a delegate here. Yes. And is quoted as having said that he thought the British model of government was the best that had ever been created. That is correct. In fact, that was one of the plans. It was referred to informally as the Hamilton Plan that was considered very briefly and immediately set aside. So is that something that uh, divided you? It did, and it did not uh, receive much in the way of support. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
It was actually for a monarchy, was it not? Well, it was for the British form of government. He felt that it was the longest lived form of government and it was a successful model and he argued for it, but uh, to no avail. So when Mr. Madison produced his plan. The Virginia plan. The Virginia plan. Yes. Was that broadly and quickly accepted? It was uh, not broadly and quickly accepted. It was debated greatly, and particularly it raised concern among some of the smaller states. Uh, New Jersey, for example, uh, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and so forth. And uh, it was given very serious consideration, but it was not ultimately accepted. There was actually a small state plan, if you would call it that, or the New Jersey plan, or the Patterson plan, mm -hmm. d uh, depending on who you were speaking to, and, and that came up with a, a variation. And ultimately, well, let me step back for just a moment. We came together in this city, and it was a very, very miserable time. It was a rainy spring. There was an outbreak of black flies. There was, the conditions alone were enough to make tempers flare. But yet we came together in a fairly reasonable manner and it looked as though things would be moving forward with rather great success early on. And then by June things began to fall apart and that is when some of these various plans were floated, if you would, the Hamilton plan, the Virginia plan, the New Jersey plan, uh, and things became very acrimonious. Uh, it was not until Mr. Roger Sherman suggested what we called the Great Compromise, uh, and he mm -hmm. borrowed from the small states plan, and he borrowed from the large states plan, and he wed them together in something that, while not everyone was happy, everyone could live with. And that is the essence of the story of the formation of this country, both at its beginning and in this room when we constrained ourselves under this Constitution. The essence being that we as Americans can overcome absolutely any obstacle. We can, if you will, defeat any adversary as long as we ultimately set aside faction and set aside division. That is what we did here with the Great Compromise. Well, that has been a sometime thing in the ensuing centuries, and um, it is uh, uh, definitely uh, necessary for success. So when we've come together for foreign wars of necessity, the country is unified. As soon as the wars are over, country goes back to divisions. I must ask you a question that is bothering me greatly because you spoke of 45 chief executives, chief magistrates, presidents. Yes indeed and uh, so <clears throat> many of them with two terms and one with three, four, pardon me, four terms. Well there is no constitutional requirement that there's a limitation. So. Uh, that has been changed sir. Oh. There is now a, a two-term limit, oh. two four-year terms. Well, that is uh, part of an amendment process. Yes, it was uh, done by a, a amendment, a legitimate amendment. Well, we, we, we can speak to that, but I, I, I must ask you a question that is burning deep inside me. The Union stands? The Union stands, but it has not always stood. The great omission, if you will, the thing that you didn't compromise on was slavery. Ah, the single subject that I most sincerely regret. And the result was a civil war. A civil war with 600,000 dead. It was a catastrophe. You know, uh, I have a strong bias for action. My personal credo is deeds, not words. And I also believe that an imperfect something is better than a perfect nothing. And I say by way of explanation, not by way of excuse, that our decision to shelve the issue of slavery 
was made because, quite simply, if we had continued to press the subject, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, indeed my beloved Virginia, would have gotten up from the, their chairs, the delegates. The Constitution would not have come together. And so, with great discussion and thought, we did shelve the issue for 20 years. It seems like from what you are suggesting that we created, in essence, a cancer that grew. Well, in fairness, um, I will point out that uh, slavery was becoming uneconomical in the South. It's a bad economic model. I, I came to realize that. And it was only because of a subsequent invention by a man from Connecticut uh, of a way of picking the cotton more efficiently that the institution was revived and survived as long as it did into the 1860s. But let me ask you, you say, had we pressed the issue, but were you pressing the issue, sir? You were a substantial owner of slaves. This is correct. Uh, and of course, I, like every individual in this room, have their own story. I, I have my own arc of thinking, if you will, and my own change of thought. You know, it was Mr. Jefferson that said that a man of 50 cannot wear the same clothing as a boy of 15. We change. That said, I did not, as I indicated to you earlier, speak much on the subject other than my primary concern. At the deepest root, my greatest drive was to come together in union. And as I mentioned just a moment ago, had we pressed the subject, that would not have happened. You, you, you know, this may not be understood widely, but what we signed here on September 17th, 17 and 87 was completely provisional. The entire thing could have devolved when we released it to the various states for ratification. If the ratification had not followed, if it did not become the law of the land, we would have become 13 individual countries again. For that is what we were a decade or more earlier when we met at that first Continental Congress in the Carpenters Guild Hall. I was a Virginia delegate. My country was Virginia. Mm -hmm. We were meeting in the country of <clears throat> Pennsylvania. Uh, we had 13 different economies. We had 13 different currencies. We had 13 different armies at the time of the first Congress. Connecticut was at war with Pennsylvania and Virginia. Nine of the colonies had standing navies. We, we had different customs, different countries, different customs. I remember walking into the Carpenters Guild Hall and a gentleman of rather diminutive stature comes at me with his hand out and he says, Colonel Washington, my name is John Adams from Massachusetts Bay. I look at his hand and I took a step back. I'm a Virginian, we don't take hands. He, being a New Englander, closes the distance with his hand up. Mm -hmm. I take another half a step back. It's a miracle that we even came together. And it all, in this room, had that subject been pressed, could have likely devolved. When those colonies came together first for the First Continental Congress, these separate nations, if you will, by the by, we did not call it the First Continental Congress. We didn't know there was going to be a second yes, one. Yes, of course. We called it the <laughs> Philadelphia Congress. Uh, what came out of that were the articles of, was the Articles of Confederation. Correct. Uh, when you came back to do what ultimately became the writing of the Constitution, your charter, as I recall, was merely to amend and fix the problems with the Articles of Confederation. It's a little more involved than that. So the Articles of Confederation actually do not come out of the First Continental Congress, but they come out subsequently during the war by Congress. Okay. Uh, that is how we are governed. I always called that a document that was on crutches, teetering, ready to fall over at any time. And so we had met in Annapolis, Maryland. 
uh, a year before this constitutional convention occurred here. And only five of the states attended. And we met so that we could iron out matters of commerce betwixt the various states. Mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 there was all kinds of tariffs, and it was very problematic. Uh, we did not have a unified currency, and it was Colonel Hamilton who suggested we need to meet. Philadelphia would be a good place to do so one year from now with all of the states in attendance. And so we did assemble here ostensibly to rewrite the Articles of Confederation. But most of us knew that was going to be unlikely. And in very short order, we not literally but symbolically tore up those articles. And we began to do something that was, if truth be told, not illegal but extra legal. Mm -hmm. Because we had, mm -hmm. been, we had been authorized by our various state legislatures as delegates, myself from Virginia, to come here to, to rediscuss and rewrite the Articles of Confederation, not to write a constitution. So what mm -hmm. we did here was actually, if you will, uh, you are a jurist, am I correct? Yes, yes. Extra legal by I, nature. I, I take the point, and the term is well chosen. So mid-September, your labors are finally completed. The document is ready to be sent to the states. One third of a year of work. And was the mood celebratory, uh, optimistic, um, congratulatory? You know, we signed that document on the 17th of September. Dr. Franklin made a mention of the top of the chair that I had been setting in throughout the entirety of the Constitutional Convention. I'm not sure if you can see it from here, but there is a sun on the horizon that the woodcarver has carved into the chair. It's slightly gilded. Mm -hmm. He said that throughout yeah. his proceedings, he was looking at that sun on the horizon. And the problem with a sun on the horizon, whether it's painted or carved in wood, is that one can never tell if it is a rising sun or a setting sun. <laughs> and with the great rancor of the discussions and debates that occurred, he felt that perhaps this union was crumbling before it could even take form. But on that day, he said that he had the great happiness to know that it was a rising sun on America and not a setting one. So, yes, I released all the delegates to go to their homes for the ratification process to commence. But many of the delegates met that night at the city tavern, very close by. We met in the long room, which was the second largest meeting space in all of United America the largest meeting space in this building here up on the second floor. And we had a celebratory dinner, but make no mistake of it, Judge. It was not a raucous affair. Mm -hmm. It was an affair in which we realized a sense of awe in what had been accomplished. And there was also a great deal of fatigue, truth be told. That said, there were many toasts, mm -hmm. Madeira wine. We had a hearty meal, and then we bid each other uh, fare thee well as we then returned to our various homes. Your countryman, George Mason, did not sign after sure. all of this labor and these proceedings because he wanted to have a Bill of Rights in the Constitution. He felt that it should be there from the very beginning. And was that a great disappointment? Well, it was a disappointment, both personally and, of course, with the idea of having his signature and a unanimous support of the Constitution. Uh, sadly, it, it weighed on our friendship, ultimately. But I could understand his thinking. It was just, again, going back to what I said earlier, an imperfect something was better than a perfect nothing. And I gave him assurances, others gave him assurances that a Bill of Rights would be among the very first things that the new Congress would take up. But uh, he still felt that it was not appropriate. 
I, I want to ask you a question only because sure. I, <clears throat> I do enjoy wine. Are there great celebrations in your day and time when the Congress comes together and accomplishes what they need to accomplish? Do uh, both houses of a bicameral house come together in celebration? Well, I, I first should point out that each house is divided, just as you had feared perhaps, certainly not hoped, into parties, into factions. This is the great bane. I warned about it in my farewell address. Yes, and it did not take long for parties to coalesce and to create coalitions that span the states and that uh, are quite rigid in that very rarely does a member of one party leave to join a different one. And so it is likely very difficult for members of one political party to celebrate with members of another political party? In public, um, it's no longer the custom. Uh, in recent years uh, in particular, there have been times when it was, uh, uh, it was done more in private, not as a public matter or not as something that's even publicized. But, uh, and friendships form, and they form even across party lines, but less and less so in recent decades. This is a cause of great upset to me. I, I, I had written that political party does little to benefit the country, but raise the interest of party above the interest of the nation. And sometimes the self-interest of a small number of unscrupulous individuals. And that is, that is of great concern. And the other concern is if that we do not come together in union then what did we really accomplish here? The people do put, a, put party before country, except when the country is threatened. And then typically, if there is an external threat, if there's a possibility of war, or there is indeed a war, it's fought um, uniformly. And it has often been said that uh, uh, political differences stop at the water's edge. If I may ask another question, I, I, I apologize. I welcome it. <laughs> there is so much to ask. You know, when I assumed the role of the chief magistrate, the president, I was seen at times by some as being stoic, uh, uh, aloof, if you will. The newspaper men would criticize Mrs. Washington and myself. Of course, understanding our times, we, we embarked upon this experiment at a time when the entire rest of the world, every nation on earth, was under the control of men and women of absolute power. Kings, queens, lords, ladies, sheiks, viziers, caliphs, potentates, maharajas, mikados, emperors, even a tsarina. I ran out of fingers. <laughs> Our demeanor was such that I felt it was important to provide an example of the national character of the American citizen in a world where the rest of the world was nobility and royalty. Things change. I am very curious with regard to the national character of America in your time and day. And I don't suppose that is a particularly easy question for you to distill for me an answer, but I, I request it anyway. Well, it's not easy, but I will attempt it. Please. In the centuries that followed, immigration continued apace. The country grew to the extent now of 330 million. There's nothing different there, with the exception of the aboriginals, the Indians. Everyone who came to these shores was an immigrant. The Washington's no different. <clears throat> exactly. And so everyone here is the descendant of, a, of an immigrant. And forging a national character out of such diverse ingredients might seem a great challenge. But I think it actually happened over the first century perhaps after the revolution, putting aside the 
division over slavery and the Civil War, and the right of a state to secede, which was the legal question surrounding s slave states. Uh, a national character of, um, of uh, a people who were entrepreneurial, uh, whether as farmers or tradesmen uh, or merchants, who, uh, uh, were, uh, who prized creativity, who came here seeking success and continued uh, when they were here to seek success. And so we've been great beneficiaries. And they contributed to the national Just so. and public cause. Just so. And they became Americans Th quickly. This, quickly. Is, this is what I envision. Of people coming here who have no English uh, find that their children um, are, half of them are not even literate in the parents' language. Mm. They've become English speaking, English reading, and writing. Well, I actually suggested this in one of my correspondence uh, pieces as well, that uh, immigrants are welcome from all corners of the earth as long as they come and they contribute, they learn our languages, and they avoid staying in their own uh, enclaves, if you will, but they, they join in to the American experience. Well, the enclaves persisted, but not to the exclusion of participation in the larger community. So there were, for instance, um, uh, cultural associations based on country of origin. There were newspapers in other languages published in the great cities. I understand this. One cannot deny their sanguinity, and, and this is appropriate. But assimilation occurred rapidly hmm. and more successfully in this country than anywhere else. To that question, I am very interested in another topic with regard to assimilation. Um, we had great problems with the aboriginals, the Native Americans. They had great problems with Europeans mm -hmm. and the white man. Mrs. Washington has said it takes two people to dance. And that is the same with animosities as well. There needs to be two sides. I always had a belief that over time, through the migration of citizenry from the eastern seaboard to the westward, and through ultimate marriage betwixt these individuals, there would be ultimately assimilation. And I am curious about the aboriginals. It's a sad story, and that's a, one instance in which assimilation has been um, less successful. Um, it might, one might say even unsuccessful. As the country expanded and the population grew, moved west, uh, new states admitted to the Union. How many are there? There are now 50, and I think that's the limit of our growth. 48 in the continental United States, and believe it or not, we bought Alaska from Russia and um, acquired the Hawaiian Islands. The Hawaiian Islands? In the middle of the Pacific Ocean, good distance away. Um, but the, the Native Americans were forced further and further west, and I mean forced, and uh, often confined in reservations, large but nonetheless limited spaces, and um, have not fared well and have not been treated well. It remained as if oil and water the assimilation did not occur. It did not occur to anything like the extent that it has with immigrants from, from abroad. Ironic, since they were here before any of us. Correct. By the way, on the question of the national character and assimilation, when people come to this country, they take an oath to the Constitution. I am heartened to hear that. To become citizens, not <clears throat> to the government of the day but to the Constitution. I am greatly heartened to hear that. You know, the document that was signed here represented the first time, to the best of my knowledge, in human history that a nation was raised up, indeed a government formed, based on ideas, not based on religion, not based on might 
makes right, not based on regionalism, mm -hmm. but based on ideas. Those ideas, those ideas have been copied and emulated in many other countries, taking our constitution with very little uh, adaptation to, to different circumstances, never with quite the same success. You know, I, I'm sorry, I, I am smiling. I'm just recalling we had pretty much gotten to the point in the process where we were ready to sign. The, the, the document was, it was about to be turned over to the Committee of, of Style. In fact, actually it had. Uh, Governor Morris was the primary one on that committee that uh, it, it contributed. But um, there had been so many arguments and it seems as if the Committee of Style, when they presented the four pages of the document, that much of the upset disappeared. And then it began again. And people <laughs> wanted to make modifications yet again. Dr. Franklin wanted to include a statement that the Congress had the right to create, dig, and build canals. Uh, uh, Mr. Mason, of course, wanted a, a, a Bill of Rights. Uh, Mr. Madison wanted a national university. And all these ideas started piling on yet again, and finally, we just said a variation of what I have shared with you twice in this discussion. An imperfect something is better than a perfect nothing. But the genius of that imperfect something was that it didn't try to deal with issues of canals and universities. And some of the countries that have emulated or adopted our constitution have extended it to have 300 articles. The, the specificity was, was uh, avoided. They've that, confused legislation with a constitution. Correct, correct. And of course we do have the amendment process so that it is a living document. Well, it's taken on life, I must say with regret, more from the judicial reinterpretation than it has from actual amendment through the legitimate process. I, I need you to explain that to me. I, I, my understanding of the amendment process was that uh, First of all, we had 12 amendments proposed. Uh, some of them were lost, actually more than that initially, but we had 10, 10 amendments that were the, the Bill of Rights. Uh, there are how many now? There are an additional 17, so that's 27, and there's one that may be ratified any day now. I personally warned that the amendment process should not be approached with a spirit of innovation, regardless of how spurious the pretext was to that innovation. It should be a difficult process to change it and a well thought out process. But I did not see the judicial branch as being a part of that process. Well, as you and your colleagues so clearly understood the ambition of individuals and the institutions that they run is a, a fact of nature, irreducible. And so uh, all of the branches of government have, have attempted to slip the bonds to acquire greater authority. And the judiciary has not only acquired greater authority in its own right, but has uh, blessed the acquisition of extra textual authority by the other branches. You have talked to me and spoken to me of two areas of great upset. One is the rise of political party and this, this idea of self-interest. Well, if it can't be a big surprise. That's why I warned about it. Well, I'm sorry if you've been disappointed by what you spawned, but, um, or what I've told you of how things turned out, but um, it, on balance, has been a great success, more than you could have imagined. I am not disappointed in the whole. For you to say that there are 45 presidents, there are 50 states that this constitution and this nation, this republic has continued despite its ups and downs because we've always had problems. I am actually very heartened 
Well, I'm very grateful because it's the Constitution that made all that possible. Thank you, sir. Oh, pardon me. I forgot the customs of the sir, country. I take your hand in the Quaker manner. <laughs> Thank you, General. I am your humble servant.